So, um, do you remember we talked about Intel, right? Uh, the thing I want you to remember, Ted Hoff. Okay, that's the only thing I want you to remember. So, what was the Ted Hoff's contribution? He figured out that, hey, rather than making one chip for every person, customized, right? Can I make one chip that is just programmable? Okay, so that was his contribution. So, he was one of the, one of the key people uh, to kind of ideate this whole part. Hmm? Uh, can I make one chip that can be used for everyone? rather than making custom chip for each customer. Because each chip took a long time. Mm. That was a pain. 4004 Intel, that chip was born. And it had, I think, thousands of transistors, if I remember correctly. So this was the first commercial microprocessor. Mm. So designer was Federico Fajin. So this is the way he looked like, and that's the 4004, the, the microprocessor that, that you have. Now, the reason I'm telling you this story, right? At that time, what was going on was, the design was done manually, hmm? like people would sit on a big table, they would do the inverters huh? and things like that. It took six months to handcraft, okay? And I know how painful it is because I have done it myself. And I told you the story about my BTEC project at IIT Bombay, right? I literally did this. I had to do just one sensor design. It took me forever to get everything right. I mean, literally each mask was done. So there is a ruby lith. The reason you use the red, red ruby lith is red will mask the red light, uh, our photoresist, which you play, uh, place, right, on the chip. It's insensitive. So we use the red color thing and then we kind of, just the way this guy is doing, right? You're cutting things to make a gate and uh, source and drain and all those things. Painful process. But people enjoyed that. They thought it was art hmm? because every person, they took really pride into this. So it was a manual art, this whole thing. Now, all that stuff was okay, right? It took six months to do it. People took pride in it. And there's a whole bunch of people who are really passionate about Ruby Lith, right? Moore's law demanded that we have to now go on a different tangent, right? We have to every year, or uh, at that time it was every year, but then in 18 months, they wanted to double the number of uh, components going on a chip. And can you imagine doing with this, this process? Very difficult, right? So that's the reason I'm showing you this. Uh, and just hold that thought. We will. We are going to go through three different tracks and then come together at, at the end. Uh, here is Carver Mead huh, around the same time. So he was at Caltech, uh, CIT, and then he was a device guy, brilliant personality. Huh? So he, uh, if you look at his life history, it's fascinating. You know, kind of things that he has done. Uh, he has worked on gallium arsenide circuits, MOSFETs, um, and um, you know, there are many people who do who zoom in. Okay, zoom into a small piece and they invent something radical. And there are many people who not only zoom in but zoom out also. Our man is a zoom out person. So he did lots of things but at the same time he had a big picture about the way the industry is going. So the reason I'm telling you these stories is because these are the people who really influence our lives. Okay, Carver Mead. And he fought with the conventional wisdom at that time. The conventional wisdom at that time was the smaller the transistor becomes, the more expensive it gets uh, and the more fragile it will be uh, and it, things are going to go to hell if I try to make transistors smaller and smaller, which uh, maybe, you know, if you had not known anything better, you would think that, right? If I try to make something smaller, oh, it's going to be really flaky type of thing, right? That was the convention. But he fought against all that stuff. So he actually coined this term called Moore's law. Moore didn't coin it. Moore just wrote a paper. But, you know, he observed this thing and he said, oh, this is Moore's law. This is, let's, this is what is going to happen in the industry. And he, he fought with everyone else and he, he kind of steered the direction, as I would like to say. And he was also at the same time educating the next set of designers. Huh? So that was a, he was a very influential person from Caltech, right? And he had a first woman student. I'm talking about 70s guys, okay? First woman student. And I find that's fascinating first woman student in engineering that Caltech graduated, that he was part of. I mean, now it looks like, uh, you know, so what's a big deal type of thing, right? But I thought that was a big deal. And he, uh, he has done so much, as I was telling you, he zoomed out person, right? So the neural networks is something that he started with. So he was modeling the stuff that's going in, in our brain, you know, how do I model into circuits? Okay, so that's what he was trying to do. And at that time, it was kind of 
you know, people really were looking at ones and zeros. That's it. That's all they wanted to do. But here is uh, Carol Car Mead. He's trying to model our brain activity into circuits. And he kind of started this neuromorphic circuits business. And I have a connection with him because Caltech. Caltech, my student who just graduated from IIT Bombay, Suraj Samaga, he's, uh, he's at Caltech. He's doing his PhD with uh, Professor Ali Hajimiri. And the promise I have taken from him is that when he graduates, na, I'll go and get a chance to meet Karwar Mead. So that's why I wanted to share with you. Okay, all right. So are you with me on this so far? So far what we have talked about. The last piece I wanted to show you was the first woman who is entering our movie right now. Okay. Lynn Conway. So she is a pioneer. She is a computer scientist. Okay. She was at MIT. And um, she came up with this, you know, out of order instructions. Okay, I think if you are in a computer architecture, you would probably know um, this out of order instruction cycle. Right? Typically, the way the computer operates is serially, tick, 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 tick. So she came up with this idea, hey, you know, and this is like bachelor student, right, coming up with something like this. Uh, and that led to development of superscalar supercomputers at IBM. You know, her idea. There is something uh, she invented in 1965 called dynamic instruction scheduling. DIS. This is all computer architecture related stuff like the people in that, that space, they are, they are very familiar with this, right? Now, what was unfortunate is that this invention is used everywhere and people even if you, if you look at IIT Bombay and you ask people who are in this field, they use this every day, but they would not know where it came from. So that's an irony. That's an irony that person who came up with this idea, 1965, is completely forgotten. Completely forgotten, zero, no credit to her. Huh? So that bothered me quite a lot. Okay, so that is uh, something interesting, right? And suddenly she appeared in 1973 at Xerox, PARC's Palo Alto Research Center. Xerox has become a canonical name, but there is a company called Xerox. The Xerox was doing a lot of pioneering innovation at that time. They were the ones who came up with the idea of mouse. Okay, so a mouse, and you know, on screen. Uh, what you see is what you get. You know what I'm talking about? Earlier it used to be just text coming up. And now, uh, now it looks like, you know, really? At that time, all you could see was text. That was all that uh, development was going on at Xerox. Uh, it's a long story if we go that track, right? Um, so there, she kind of looked at what was going on everywhere. Uh, imagine a person in computer architecture. She is a computer architecture person who is just dealing with algorithms and all that stuff, right? And she looked at what was going on in the industry and she said, kya ho hai? Huh? Log, we are 1000 transistor circuit, we are designing it by hand, where are we going to go? We cannot go anywhere. So she kind of thought about it and she said, this is no good. Huh? We have to design an app for this. Standardized chip design. How do we standardize everything? So that was her idea. Hmm? So... Um, I like to say what uh, Steve Jobs said, right? App for everything. There is app for everything. But she thought like, oh, there has to be a computer program for everything. Okay. So she kind of looked at this whole situation from the top. And she said that we have to use computer to design a computer. I hope you can grab your head, head around the revolutionary part of it. Earlier, it was the humans who were designing the computer. There was, um, you know, we just talked about him. They were doing ruby lathe cutting, everything. It was all manual labor. So it's like, you know, you want to build a building, then there is, you take a lot of Gandhi people and, you know, one brick at a time and, you know, you wait for uh, nine months. With that kind of work, you cannot build a skyscraper. Right, Anushka? Yeah? Okay. So uh, the, the key idea here was uh, using kind of some kind of algorithm, some kind of computer program to design the computer itself. So that was, in my opinion, that was like the wow moment. Uh, people at that time didn't realize it, but when I look back and I read history, uh, it's very fascinating that she came up with this idea. She got uh, hooked with Carver Mead. They both of them really resonated with each other in terms of ideas. Um, and I'm going to connect the dots for you a little bit later, right? Uh, she went to MIT to teach, uh, like, how do I make everything standardized? So whatever she has done, we use it every day right now. When, uh, like, when you're using Cadence, when you're using uh, doing a layout, right? Those design rules, everything. It's kind of a fallout of her idea. Let's make everything standard, standardize everything, widths, lengths, how much margin we have to leave, everything standardized. And then all the foundries will follow same standardized model so that anybody can do design anywhere and we can print it anywhere. 
and so she started with this revolution she actually taught classes at mit during that class uh, the class students actually designed a chip and it was sent out for fabrication all of them worked and a fascinating story right and mosis is uh, is like a service where you design your chip huh? okay now typically when you design your chip as a company you have to print that chip on everywhere and you have to pay for the whole thing whole way for mass set it's millions and millions of dollars very expensive so her idea was hey let's take you know designs from everyone and put it on the same reticle and then in the same cost i can get hundreds of people share the cost so that was the key idea and that mosis is what i use for my phd thesis literally at that time because uh, um, i can't afford millions of dollars as a student right so then we we share the cost with whole bunch of other people um, and then we get our piece for testing you get less number of parts but it's okay i can test my parts okay so this concept of shared wafer came from here and uh, the us government was also very keen on this because they were realizing that hey, we have to push into technology we have to educate people darpa was involved and they really pushing that hey uh, you know everybody needs to get into this space because this is what is going to create the future pipeline something similar that's happening right now in our country you know so she kind of worked on the chip design methodology basically as i would like to say uh, she was honored as a member of national academy which is like the top honor we call it bharat ratna huh? here she was honored with bharat ratna of united states in engineering amazing right why am i telling her story right uh, first of all um, as a woman she made uh, her mark in this whole system right and what um, what caught my hurt me is like she didn't get credit for something that was uh, that is used by everyone right the story gets even more interesting so this is the only person who is featuring twice with two different things right uh, so she was born as a boy and she had the software of a girl i mean her brain was of a girl a uh, woman but uh, she was born as a boy okay all right uh, and uh, 1967 she tried to change from a boy to boy to girl at that time as a result of this process she was quite affected by it uh, she was suicidal depressed a really difficult situation she was going through hmm? she was fired from ibm okay in 1968 she was fired because she wanted to get this surgery done and she wanted to live like a woman she was fired can you believe that and now you'll realize why she didn't get credit for her work all the work that she did before that time okay and uh, there was at that time there was so much stigma fear Uh, persecution in united states about anybody who's different okay people just thought man and a woman that's it polarized opinions but then somebody could be different nobody could digest that so she lived in fear all the time and so finally she went to went out of the country she got all the stuff done and she actually came back you know as a witness protection i mean she didn't get witness protection i'm just telling you as a, as a witness protection right so she, she changed everything when she came back after her surgery she was a different person she had to give up everything that she she did before that t equal to you know when she got the surgery done okay and she lost all the credit to all the work the thought work that she did you know such pioneering work even in computer architecture what she did okay um so so she had to give up all that stuff and then she lived in stealth mode for 30 years nobody knew about this for 30 years after all this stuff happened so i think 90s is when people uh, kind of she came out and kind of uh, discussed this right till that time she was a different person nobody knew anything of course she was married and you know uh, later on and you know they had a very long marriage and things like that she became a transgender activist after that to give them rights okay you know they are humans too um she was at university of michigan why am i saying this because i have another student at university of michigan and he just finished his phd uh, rohit rathe and uh, so all these things are connecting together for me they are close to my heart in that sense right and then uh, she passed away just recently in june fascinating story right uh, i i hope you realize um, people who have affected us Uh, so much day to day life but they, nobody knows about them okay now why am i telling this right so both of them together need and convey wrote a book 
system called Introduction to VLSI Systems. All right, and this book, of course, it has changed my life forever. Okay, and I have that book with me, huh? and this is from that time. Okay, and the beauty of this book at that time for me, and I didn't, I couldn't afford it at that time, huh? but it was like this, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures, right? So, and I would open something like this, and you know my, I would do this. Ah, oh, this is so good. Color pictures, that was, we had never seen this. Color pictures in a book, right? I mean, this really is fascinating, by the way, to read the book, right? So both of them wrote this book, and the intent was very simple. How do we democratize IC design? Right? How do we standardize everything? Uh, if you can buy one book, I don't think you can buy this book anymore. Uh, it's probably out of print, but um, if you want to touch the book, I'll let you touch uh, it. The cool part about this book is I have an autograph copy. From not, not from Lynn, I wish, all right? Uh, because then this would be like worth billion dollars, right? Um, so my own professor, Professor Vasi, he was here. He has written a beautiful note, handwritten note for me. And when he retired, I had gone to his office and he gave me this book. And it's, it's my most prized possession, okay, this particular book. Because this book has uh, not just transformed me, but so many other people that are going to come into this picture, movie that we are going to talk about, right? Um, what, what really bothers me is, uh, um, after I went through uh, Lynn Conway's story, is that there is no movie made on this. Right? Because such a fascinating story, such a there are so many extreme emotions going back and forth uh, in this whole story, and I hope somebody listens to this and they make a story, they make a movie out of it because she should not be forgotten because such a tumultuous life that she has had. Thank you very much.